Good evening. Good evening. It's good to be here again this evening. My name is Wick Hubers. I think uh, the last time I was here at Bethel, I was uh, working full time at Center Fresh Egg Farm. Uh, currently, I'm at Morris Reformed Church as their calling pastor, and I guess I endeared myself so much to Center Fresh, they insisted I stay on part time there as well. So still get to uh, haul some eggs for Bruce, but uh, it is good to be here, uh, good to gather as God's children, to gather as his people to worship, and that's what we have gathered to do, and God calls us to worship from, uh, with words from Psalm 148, and I invite you to stand as we uh, hear his call and open our service. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights above. Praise the Lord from the earth, creatures in creation itself. Praise the Lord, kings and princes, rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men, women and children. Praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. And indeed, it is good that all things that have breath, even us this evening, that we too are called to praise the Lord. Lord God, as we gather again today before you and your throne, our prayer is that the words of our mouths, the thoughts that we have, the praise that we bring, that all of it will be pleasing in your sight. May it be a sweet sound in your ear that it all focuses on you and brings honor to you alone. We pray in your name. Amen. And let's uh, praise God with the words of the hymn, O oh, the Deep deep love of Jesus. Help is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth receive now its greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. As God has welcomed and greeted us this evening. Let's welcome each other to worship.
And let's uh, continue our praise with uh, Amazing with Jesus Loves Me. In grace, my chains are gone.
seated. As we prepare to hear God's word, let's ask for his blessing on it. Father, we stand amazed that you reveal yourself to us in your word. And Lord, we come again seeking your grace. We, um, we're amazed, Lord, at the grace that you offer us. And so as we read this portion of your word again this evening, we pray that you would bless it to our hearing, to our minds, and to our hearts, Lord. And may you receive the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture this evening comes from Psalm 51. Psalm of David, beginning at verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I have been a sinner from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper, build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. That's far the reading of God's word. In verse 10 of Psalm 51, David's psalm there, he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And as I thought about the circumstances around this psalm, and as I looked at that verse, I thought, you know, we read it, and we can put our own expression on the words as we read them, create in me a, a pure heart. But, but I think if we could have heard David say those words, if we could have been there as, as he penned them, that they would have been a, a cry from uh, depths of despair in his soul. Uh, they would have been a, a cry to God saying, God, you create in me a clean heart. It's the heart, Lord. For David, when, when he said heart, when he, when he used that word, he was thinking about the center of his core being. He was thinking of his very human spirit. It's from there that, that his emotions would spring forth. His thoughts came from there. His motivations for what he did or didn't do would come from his heart. And, and it, was, it was from his heart that he would get the courage or have the courage to act rightly as God would have him. And so, so David here, I, I think he's crying. He, he says, I need a new heart, God. I need a new one. And, and when we do consider what brought David to 
uh, this point of, of crying out, it makes sense, to this point of penning Psalm 51. Uh, from the outside, you know, when we think of David and when we talk about David, uh, we have uh, someone who we think, well, that person would have it all together. That person knows what it's about because David should be able to look at himself and declare, yep, I want to please God. I want to live for him. And after all, doesn't David pray? Isn't it David who, who writes the best psalms? Isn't it David who praises the best? Doesn't David sense God's presence with him, right? Isn't that the David we think of? But yet, at this point in his life, it's David who's wondering how in the world he could have failed his God so miserably. The psalm was written after the whole debacle with Bathsheba and Uriah. David had committed adultery. He had tried to cover it up and even ended up murdering Uriah in the process. And so the prophet Nathan has come to David and Nathan has told him point blank, blank to his face, says, David, you're the one who sinned. And David was convicted in his heart. And when you read 2 Samuel 12, I think it shows us, if not the lowest, one of the pretty much one of the lowest points in King David's life. And so it's a broken, it's a contrite David here that cries out to God that, that he needs a new heart. And in essence, his cry becomes the cry of all those who desire to please God. Everybody who, who has that sense, I know who God is. God is my father. God has called me as his child. And they desire to please him. But they fail, just like every single one of us do. And so it's a cry of all who grieve God because of sin in their life. And so David's cry becomes our cry, the, the cry of a spiritually thirsty person, the, the cry of all who, like David, are frustrated, they're, they're depressed because we cannot live up to God's standards. And we know it, we sense it. We, we live in that tension. And what is it? What is it we're trying to live up to? Well, God's standard of perfection. In Matthew 5, 48, Jesus talks about radically following the law. He talks about keeping the law in their life and doing it perfectly because God, your heavenly Father, is perfect. Therefore, that's your standard. Go after that, perfection. That's quite a standard to keep, isn't it? Perfection. So no wonder our, our soul thirsts to live better than we do. Because like David, we want to, but we fail. And like David, we have this sense that, that, that we cannot get it perfect. We can't. And the problem, when we realize that, the problem isn't out there somewhere. The problem isn't... Uh, because of the way we were raised or, or because our parents did something wrong. The problem isn't because of, uh, of circumstances in our life, and so that's why I act the way I do. That's why I, I end up doing wrong. It's because it's just the things that happen to happen to me. The, the problem isn't even with the church or, or the elders or, or any of that. We have to look at the truth that the problem is our core. The problem is our heart. And so this evening, we want to look at the desire, the reality, and the answer to what David was going through here. The desire, the desire of what David faced. And basically, David desired to live as the law of God directed him to live. That's what he wanted. He loved the law, but he kept running into the impossibility of being able to do that. And I don't know, I, I would imagine, if you're like me, you've, you've had those circumstances in life where you want something, you want to do something, but it's impossible. And they're even good things. 
You, you want to serve, but your health keeps you from doing it, and you just can't do it. Or, or you want to physically do something, and you just can't do it. I, I can recall a time in, in my life, fleetingly, that, that I thought I could be a pretty good basketball player. When, when I was a kid, I was uh, fairly fast and pretty co coordinated, and, and we lived for a while in Southern California, and, and across the street from us, I had a friend that I went to school with named Charlie Postma. And Charlie and I would play basketball together after school, quite often in the afternoon. And, and Charlie was a lot like me. He was uh, horizontally challenged, and, and when we played together, we could have a lot of fun, and we could be pretty good uh, against each other. And so I began to think, uh, after some time, I thought, boy, it sure would be fun to dunk the basketball, wouldn't it? Uh, last week on, on TV, there was some of those dunking contests, and it's just amazing. Those guys just fly through the air and dunk it. And I thought, you know, I should be able to dunk the ball. I'm pretty good. And, and for obvious reasons, I couldn't do it. And, and if I hadn't wised up, even though I, I had the legs to jump, even though I had the ball to do it, even though the net was there, I couldn't do it. And if I had not wised up, I could have spent a lifetime of trying and failing and getting depressed because I couldn't do it and then going back and trying to do it again, but I would fail every single time. Well, that basketball hoop would then have become what, in a sense, the law was for David. Uh, I could like the hoop, I could shoot at the hoop, I could dream about it, but as I said, I wasn't going to dunk it, ever. Well, David loved the law of God. David loved God's word. Uh, Psalm 119 says, oh, how I love your law, I meditate on it, I, I understand it, I have your words before me day and night. And if David had never understood that he, was, that he could not keep the law perfectly, he would have ended up like some of the Pharisees did later on in, in the uh, Jewish history. Uh, they would have the trappings of religion as a guide for life. They would have rules to follow, but they would be trying to follow those rules without having a relationship with God having a religion where he believed he could perfectly please God, but he could do it on his own power. He could do it on his own strength. But here, when we read this psalm, when I read that, I thought, you know what? David had an aha moment, didn't he? David got it. He's realizing that his religion was of no value. He realized that as long as his heart was crooked, as long as his core was messed up, this, the, the core was dirty and unclean, he realized that he couldn't do anything that could be perfect for a perfect God. He would have failed. He would fail. That was the reality of what he faced. What God wanted, even what David wanted, Sincerely, he could not do. Centuries later, the Apostle Paul, like David, he struggled with the same thing. He struggled with, with that desire that he had and the reality that he faced. Paul was, was hit with the fact that he was a spiritually thirsty person, but he was unable to satisfy that thirst by his own strength. Romans 7 uh, Verse 24, Paul expresses it like this. He says, what a wretched man I am. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Paul says, there's no hope. He's dead. Like David, he ran into the conflict of his desire, but the reality of sin in his life. And that can be a tough spot, can it? We've probably been there. We pray to God and, and we say, God, deliver me. But yet that sin keeps showing up. That sin keeps nagging us or, or sneaking in somehow. But the, the truth is, is that that struggle, that struggle we have has to take place. 
In fact, I think if a Christian is not struggling with sin, on this side of heaven, we may have a problem. If we have no struggle, we're probably dead in the water, not, not really even desiring then to live as God wants. Like the sailing quote says, if you're not making waves, you're not underway. If we claim to be living for Christ and life is perfect, we have no problems, there's no struggles, maybe we need to check and see, are we really walking? Are, are we following God? Are, are we going in the direction he wants us to go? Are we underway? And in a sense, it's like the catechism lays out, that, that beautiful document from the 1500s, an amazing document that, that we have as a confession of our faith that, that says this is what the Bible teaches. And in Lord's Day 23, it comes after a, a whole section of teaching on the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed talks about God, right? God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it teaches us about, uh, teaches us about him. And the Catechism has questions and answers that, that bring us through that whole section uh, on God, on the, on the Creed. And then it asks one of those wonderfully practical questions. It says, so what good does it do you to believe all this? You can believe it. You can have the words you, you can say they're great, but what good does it do to believe all this? We say we believe it, but if those beliefs don't penetrate our hearts, if they don't make a difference in our life, then in essence, they're, they're worthless. So the first part of uh, question and answer 60, it, it identifies the reality of the struggle that we live in. Uh, it says, how are you right with God? Well, by, by true faith, only by true faith in Jesus Christ. And then the answer goes on. It says, even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, and even though I'm still inclined toward all evil, that's the reality those are some pretty strong words that, that the catechism lays out there. That, that's what King David ran into. That's what, what the Apostle Paul agonized over. And when we're honest with ourselves, it's what we run into in our own lives. Sin is the reality because I miss the mark of God's desire for my life. We even miss the mark of our own desire for our life. So in 2 Samuel 12, when, when the prophet Nathan told David that, that he was the man who sinned, that, that he was the one who acted unjustly, David, you're the one who stole, who committed adultery, you're the one who even murdered, David didn't try to come up with excuses. He, he did not try to say, well, Nathan, hold on here a minute. I have every right. After all, I'm the king. The king can do that. It's my prerogative. When David was convicted in his heart, all he could do was respond with a cry, with a cry from his gut, asking God for a new heart. Create in me a new heart. He, he knew he did not deserve it, so he wasn't demanding it. It, it was a cry that was begging forgiveness it was a cry that said, I've sinned against you, God, and those sins are plaguing me, so God, I'm coming to you. David's cry indicates that he was broken, that he was humbled. It indicates that, that he could not rely on himself, and he knew that full well. He knew he couldn't do it. He could only cry to God and say, God, make me a new heart. So what's the answer to David's cry? What's the answer to, to Paul's agonizing over who can deliver me from this body of death that he found himself in? What's the answer to, to our cry today when we say, God, help me live right? Well, the answer, well, we can see what the answer is not. 
The, the answer is not found in, in David saying, God, you know, I'm trying, but your laws are just too tough. God, if you would just give me some, some easier laws, give me a, a pass once in a while if I have to follow these or, or wink at this once in a while uh, because I'm doing the best I can. That was not the answer David came to. In, in other words, David did not ask God to, to lower the hoop so that he could dunk it even once in a while. Paul did not ask God to fix his wretched feeling by, by legalizing the sin that was plaguing him. Legalizing the wrong does not make it right. Think about that one in the culture and climate that, that we live in today. Legalizing it does not mean that it's right in God's eyes. The answer, the answer is somehow for the law to be written on our heart so that the desire to get it right comes from inside of us. And the only way to reach that, that perfect goal that, that God sets before us is that we accept by faith the work of Jesus Christ so that Jesus can live in us, so that it's Jesus who is walking in us. That's our only hope for it to come from inside of us but for Jesus to be there. Because the outside rule isn't going to compel us. Our own strength, our, our own power, our own resolve to say, I'm going to get it right this time, it, it will not do it. Only Christ living in us can enable us to reach the desire of our heart. And Christ does it, not us. In fact, Christ covers our shortcomings by doing it for us. And, and that's the second part of, of what the catechism says. It, 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 even though I'm accused of my sin, even though I, I know I never get any of it right, even though it's always before my face, nevertheless, I love that, nevertheless, without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, as if I had been perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is accept this gift from God with a believing heart, a believing heart so that Christ can change the heart. And to that we say amen. The, the, the cry of the human heart is answered in Christ. David knew in his inner being that God had to do it for him. Paul shows us he, he knew the answer in the words that follow in that same verse. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, he says, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then a chapter later in Romans 8, he tells us that, that what the law was powerless to do, therefore what we are powerless to do because by our own strength, he says what the, the law was powerless to do because of sinful human nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be made a sin offering for us. No matter how much we love the law, no matter how perfectly we strive to keep it, it cannot save us. David got that. David knew that. That was, that was where that cry came from of despair, saying, God, I can't do it on my own. I, I need a new heart from you. David looked forward even to what Paul would say in Ephesians 2 that, that it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It's a gift from God, not by work, so no one can boast. So how does God save us? By his Son, Jesus Christ, living in us, and by us with a believing heart, inviting him in to live there. You know, often we say, well, we're saved by faith. Faith does not save us. It's who we have our faith in. 
that we're saved, our faith in Jesus Christ. So back up a question. So what good does it do you to believe all this? What good does it do you? Well, the answer is, in Christ, I'm right with God. And I'm an heir to life everlasting. That's the resting place. That's knowing what God has done for us. And not trying to do it ourselves. Basically, we need to stop trying to get our ducks in a row all by ourselves. I've been there, I've tried that, and I keep trying at times too, and I can assure you it doesn't work. Christ says, come to me. Come to me with your crooked row of ducks and let me straighten them. He says, come to me with with everything in your life. Come to me with your emotional hurts. Come to me with your addictions. Come come to me with the, the pain and the frustrations that you have in in trying to even deal with life. And he says, come to me and let me take care of them. If I'm in your heart, I'll give you a new one. I'll make it new. And it's only then that we can live as God calls us to live, knowing that he's looking at Jesus Christ in us. So come to God then with pure hearts, hearts that are created by the presence of Jesus Christ in your heart. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that our faith is in you alone, that it's in Christ and not in ourself. And Lord, we we pray today for your Holy Spirit to move powerfully in and among us, to move through us. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, bring us to faith if we're not there. Bring us to Jesus Christ alone. And we thank you that you indeed are a loving God who has made that salvation possible, even though from the depths of our uh, despairing hearts, we know we can't do it. It's then that you pick us up. And so bring us there, Lord, to your name's honor and glory. Amen. Let's uh, respond with, uh, O come my soul, sing praise to God, number 297, stanzas 1, 3, 4, and 5.
come before God with our prayers. Father, indeed, we give thanks to you. We give thanks to you for your name, your name that reminds us of the deeds that you have done, Lord, deeds that uh, we're assured of that are true, that are true of you throughout Scripture. Deeds, Lord, even that we see even in our own day, even this day, as we wake up to uh, a new day. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the beauty of this earth. We thank you for the amazing love that we can experience from you, that we can return back to you, but love too, Lord, in, in relationships and, uh, and in those relationships where we see your characteristics of goodness and, and kindness, patience. Lord, all those things that, that you show to us in revealing yourself to us, Lord, we thank you that we are allowed to experience them in so many ways. And yet, Lord, we confess that, that oftentimes it's so easy to, uh, to not remember. It's so easy to turn our backs on you. And so we, uh, as we're reminded, as uh, marriages begin and families are started, we're, uh, we're often reminded during those times that, that there are often tensions that we bring and, and that we fail to bring to you and it puts tensions on those relationships. And so we pray for marriages, Lord. We pray for uh, our families. We pray, Lord, for uh, those who, um, who are single, who desire to uh, live their life, uh, even as Paul did, in, a, in a, a way that's honoring and pleasing to you. And we pray, Lord, for those who desire to be married, who desire those relationships, and, and we ask for your blessing on them during perhaps a time of waiting or patience as well. Lord, we do pray for our children, for those in, in school, all the way from uh, preschool on up through uh, institutions of higher learning. We pray that uh, as that learning takes place, that whether it's uh, explicit or not, that your face would always be seen, that we would realize in our learning, Lord, that it's you who are behind everything, even creation itself. And so we pray for our students. We pray, Lord, for our elderly, uh, for those that perhaps are confined to homes or uh, care facilities, and we pray for your blessing on them there. May they never have a time when uh, they don't feel loved by you, but Lord, may your church always be uh, there with, with a hug or, or with words of encouragement. Uh, Lord, we do pray that, that they would not feel lonely and that uh, we would uh, encourage those that find themselves uh, toward the end of life. Lord, we uh, pray too for uh, those who desire your healing in a special way. All those listed in the, the bulletin that uh, were, were brought by this con congregation this morning and, and Lord, others in our community and family circles that, uh, that perhaps are facing difficult times. Uh, Lord, times of, of disease or accident or, or illness and we pray for your healing touch, a healing touch that would bring honor and glory, Lord, not to us, but, but that would return that glory back to you in your powerfulness. And so we do pray for caregivers and doctors, and we thank you for the wisdom and the discernment that uh, you allow us to have. But Lord, we rely first, last, and solely on your hand and your care for us as well. And so, Lord, we pray, too, for our nation uh, and the world today. Lord, there's uh, things that uh, if we would forget that you are in control, that could be scary for us, and perhaps they even are uh, still scary. But, Lord, we pray for your hand, for your working. Uh, Lord, no matter what the world says, no matter what other religions say that do not seek you. We know that you are God, that this world belongs to you, and that you are in control. And so we pray for uh, 
for your world. We pray, Lord, for uh, our nation, even the uh, politics of our nation. Um, it doesn't seem to be uh, going well to uh, be so polarized that, that we can't seem to work together. And so we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would smother us with your love, that you would work in people's hearts, and that you would guide and, and give discernment to those who make decisions. And Lord, we pray too for uh, your blessing on the rest of this day. We thank you for it. We thank you too for the opportunity to, uh, to bring offerings of thanks to you, and we pray that you would bless those offerings uh, that we bring so that your kingdom may be advanced and that your will be done through them. In your name we pray, amen. This time the evening offerings will be received. Our statement of faith this evening comes from our world belongs to God. And let's stand as we uh, say those words together from uh, paragraphs 24 and 28. God remembered his promise to reconcile the world to himself. He has come among us in Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh. He is the long awaited savior fully human and fully divine, conceived by the Spirit of God and born of the Virgin Mary. Bring God and man, Jesus is the only mediator between God and his people. He alone paid for the debt of our sin. There is no other Savior. In him the Father chose those whom he would save. His electing love sustains our hope. God's grace is free to save sinners who offer nothing but their need for mercy. Man of Sorrows, 
Let's uh, sing the first three stanzas. <laughs> been good to be in God's house. It's been good to praise and worship him. And as we go now into this uh, rest of this day and this week, we go with God's parting blessing from the book of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>